Snake Davis, I can't believe it. It's, you know, it's a tragedy, and I have to apologize that we haven't been able to hug each other for all these years. And, I know. It's and truly tragic. We live too far apart. It is. And I, I just want to say to my Radio Richard listeners that Snake Davis is one of those people that it's hard not to adore. <laughs> Don't your fans find that, Snake? I am adored, Richard. I, I, I must admit, I'm, it's a beautiful thing. And I'm so lucky with lovely adoring fans. Yeah, I'm more. I'm a windowed. I'm not quite adored, but I'm, you know, getting there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, this is great. Look, see, so I, the thing is, you, you've got. I knew you'd have a beautiful setup. You know, this is this makes it so easy for me. But I have my cup of coffee, and I and I. I have a tea for me. And I have my my wife's bagels. Oh, lucky! You're yeah, ahead of me. Though. Seriously, man, they're just—it's just mind-blowingly good. So, <laughs> but what I want to ask you about is, see, the thing is, first of all, I mean, we could talk about your career, which has been fantastic, and you've worked with all these wonderful and famous people, and you've done a million studio work. But you've gone beyond that because, you know, I talk to a lot of guys who are studio musicians, but you've created a career for yourself as a solo artist, which, mm -hmm. and you've done it really well, and you've done it without having to make millions, but you've, you've just been, you've been kind of like the hip turtle who, you know, the hip tortoise, <laughs> who, who just, you know, one step at a time, just keeps moving forward inexorably like a, like a funky uh, shark through the water, you know, mm -hmm. Keeping going. So tell me some of the thinking from the early days when we were doing sessions together. That you're thinking towards your solo thing, all the, all the you know things that you've done because you've done so many. So tell me what your thinking was. Okay, I will do, and I like the image of being a funky shark or whatever it was. Yes, it was good, uh, wasn't it? I'm going to go even further back, Richard, and really from from the first time that I got on. Uh, a stage in a village hall at a youth club playing guitar and singing at the age of 14 15 i thought i love this it gave me a special feeling it gave me a tingle down the spine which i'm repeating now just for you and really that was that was the start i hadn't thought about a saxophone at that point but when i did meet the saxophone after within a few months i thought flipping heck i wonder if i could actually do this forever as a job you know and I decided I was going to have a go but all I really ever wanted to do my passion was I wanted to be in a band and repeat that experience that I'd had standing on that village hall stage and feeling great and people looking at me and in enjoying what I was doing and me feeling this, this is working so the session thing it was it was just a happy spin-off. I thought, hmm, you know, I played in a club and one night and somebody uh, was introduced to me who I hadn't ever met before. And he said, oh, I'm making some music at Granada TV. I, I need a sax player. Um, would, would you be interested? And I, I thought, oh, that sounds like a lot of fun, as long as it doesn't hurt my spirit. And I had a think, and I thought, is that going to damage me? No, it'll be a challenge and it'll make me money and it won't stop me doing the other things. And that was always my attitude to sessions. And I've turned down many, many sessions because I haven't been able to make the date because I've been busy playing at the Dog and Firkin on that particular night. And yeah, with that, very few exceptions, I'll always prioritize my own gigs, you know. And I and I must say it's a Firkin great place to play. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, but I just want to interject here at this point. Yeah, yeah. I, I was introduced to you, Snake, by Richard Darbyshire, the fantastic oh, yeah. singer-songwriter, yeah. uh, you know, a mind-blowing singer, a great guy, yeah, incredibly talented. But I remember I was looking for somebody to, you know, be in Bamzilla, mm. because I won't tell that sort of story. Oh, I mean, no. Well, maybe we can, but anyway, the point is I needed somebody, and he said, man, I think that's when we first met. Is that right? The the the, the uh, Ruby Wax show. Yeah, I think so. It was either that or, you know, I think my very first posh London 
um, recording session was with you and Judy Took. Oh yeah, Judy Took, right, right. Yeah, that's an interesting story. I don't, but, I don't know which one came first, but it well, was. Well, I don't either. But all I know is that Richard Darbisher said, "Seriously, man, you gotta, you gotta." I, I know this guy Snake Davis, and he's. I said, "That's his real name." He is. Yeah, that's his real name. Um, you know, he he actually chooses Chris as his stage name. <laughs> but his parents called him Snake. So I said, oh, that's a great story. So so he said, this guy's outrageous. So you've got to use him. And of, of course, I did. And that's how, you know, word of mouth. I, I know that when people started hearing about you, you were kind of feared, not because you were big time, but because you were the opposite. I mean, you know, some some studio players... You know they come in and you know it's all this business it, that wasn't snake davis you you came in and you were just so calm and relaxed and sure yeah let's do that great fine and and uh, so that was that was just i'm just saying as a little additive of how we met and how i was introduced to you yeah so um, you can uh, now can you can continue on from <clears throat> starting sessions well really um there was some cruise boat work in between having left music college i went on the cruise boats but every time i went on a cruise boat which one does to make money and perhaps see the world but mostly to make money every time it was a means to an end it was a means to earn some money to start the next band buy the next 10 year old transit van uh, buy another saxophone something like that or, right. or in one case it was and means to dropping off in New York and getting some lovely lessons from Eddie Daniels and um, a couple of other players. But it was always, whenever I was doing a session or, or being a sideman, um, I was enjoying it and enjoying the challenge, enjoying the, th the, th the thrill, the, the music, the money. But my sights were always set on the next snaky gig or the next snaky lineup that was down down the track somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's still the way I am, really. Not much has changed since then. Well, talk just a little bit about the solo, apart from your bands, which, of course, you've always had bands. Yep. But you've had some interesting concepts, and I thought it was, you know, just a genius concept for you to do, you know, the famous sax solos. I'm not sure what you call it. What you call oh, yeah, it? We, call that, we call that classic sax solos. Yeah. Uh, that was an idea that it really was um, a sort of bubble that just appeared in my head. You know, as as youngsters, we we learn lots of solos, the ones that we love. In my case, Michael Brecker and David Sanborn and Junior Walker. I learned those solos as everybody does, cutting their teeth and and um, yeah, hey, hey. Michael Brecker. Okay, fine. All right, just just threw that in. I'm dressing the stage. You know. <laughs> well, well. So here's the here's the thing that interests me about that snake. Hmm. The thing that interests me about that is, and this is a subject which I mainly want to talk about today, is uh -huh. there are a lot of really fantastic saxophone players. And as the years go by, there are even more really fantastic saxophone players. However, it seems that, you know, they're kind of clones. They, they pretty much sound the same. And the thing that impressed me and everybody else who heard you at the time when I first heard you was, wait a minute, this guy can do the kind of funky, soulful saxophone sound, but he doesn't sound like Brecker. He doesn't sound like Sanborn. He doesn't sound like anybody. He just sounds slithery. And completely, he's got his own thing. And you've yeah. always had your own yeah. thing. And I'm going to put you really on the spot now. And I want to demonstrate to people mm -hmm. the difference between an ordinary person playing a melody and Snake playing a melody. So I want you to pick up that horn that's over there. Uh, any horn that you like. I don't mind. So the saxophone would be nice. Good. Okay, there, see, he's playing a tenor saxophone, people. Okay, so I want you to choose any well-known tune. I mean, you know a million well-known tunes. I don't care what it is. Let it be or something like that. 
or mm -hmm. you know some some well-known tune and just play eight bars of it the way you know a straight ahead ordinary kind of person would play it and then i want you to play it again but add snakiness to it okay i mean the first one is is harder to play it not the way i'd normally play it but i know okay. what you mean like i'm going to play it like i'm reading the dots kind of thing and that, okay great yeah. all right then. Lovely. And now, and now we're going to get you in full snake, very slimy slitheriness. Okie dokie. <laughs> Okay, so now, I don't know if you want to do it or I want to do it, but I want you to tell me the kinds of things that you added to that to make it snake. Well, sure thing. I mean, I'll have a go and then you can take over. If, if all right, go, go. To, but it's something that I never thought about in the early years. Probably when we met, I wouldn't have ever thought about anything like that, except I did know at that point that, I wanted to sound like myself. I wanted my own sound. I wanted my identity. But I'm not sure how I went about it. But now I speak to students, youngsters, an awful lot. So I've gone through this process and I've kind of worked backwards and think I know what's going on. And really, I play nearly all the time like I'm singing. And if, um, if I'm playing a melody which has words, the words are in my mind. And if I'm playing a melody that doesn't have words, I play it very lyrically as though I was singing. Right. And if, if I'm learning something like Somewhere Over the Rainbow, um, <clears throat> then I'll sing a phrase and then play it and sing it again. And if a student comes to me and says, oh, when I play, it's all boring and plain. I say, let's go through Georgia and go, Georgia, and then toot toot. Yeah. And see how your vocal informs your your playing your instrumental right, playing right that's what's going on really well now i'm going to add the richard niles kind of phd analysis of <laughs> snake's playing so one of the main elements that to me is a is a snake trademark that you use in a way that no one else i don't know any other saxophone player who uses it the way you do. And I'm probably gonna ruin your playing forever by saying this, because then you're gonna think about it and you'll think, oh, I can't do it. I promise not to. It's your use of dynamics. Mm -hmm. Nobody goes from ah, like, like Snake does. Mm -hmm. So, you know, your use of dynamics on certain notes, of course, it all of these things you do add emotion to the, to the melody you're playing, but what is especially effective is this amazing, and not only that, when you use the dynamics, you are, the, the tone of the saxophone is still full. Even when you're playing a whisper, it's this warm, you know, you don't have, first of all, here he is, the snake's playing the tenor. Now, a lot of tenor players get this very hard. They're trying to emulate Michael Brecker, and there's nothing wrong with that. He's, you know, a great genius. But... That's not the snake sound. The snake sound is warm, poor baby oil all over you, hugging, kissing, nuzzling. <laughs> that's the that's the snake. So that you have this actual tonal center which is warm. And you I don't know how you produce that. In fact, I'd like you to pick up the tenor mm -hmm. and get a and get the hard sound and then get your normal sound. 
or do it the other way around, whatever you want to do. Okay. I don't know if I can do this, but I'll try. Okay. So, so what I want you to do is hit, just, just play three notes that are really, really the hard kind of brash. I won't well, say brash, but the hard kind of Brecker hard nose kind of sound. Okay, Which isn't snake sound. You can, yeah, okay. Right. Okay. So now, hearing that same thing, which is great, but play it in that snaky kind of way with the snaky tone. Yeah. See that, and there is the difference, folks. And there's the, now another thing that that you do to make the melody different. I mean, of course. See. The great thing about Snake is he is a warm person, so he has this emotional center to everything that he does, so he thinks of that. But I'm going to just show for the people out there who, you know, they, they don't necessarily feel what he feels because nobody can feel what Snake feels. So, but just thinking of it from a technical point of view, you take a melody and the little additions and melismas and and you might call them licks but they're not licks they're just uh enclosures or little soulful uh phrases bits that you add to things that only comes from years of listening and absorption of music so for instance georgia if you if you just play the opening bars of georgia go ahead mm -hmm. Okay, right there. That's that's enough. I mean, that tells you everything. So you you didn't just play Georgia. You play wanna tell you Georgia, and then <laughs> baby Georgia. You know, you you added it. that was Snake singing, but he added stuff that a great singer would sing, or you know, Ray Charles would sing, or yeah. So that the melodic additions is also something that is what snake does and the other thing is that the ones that you choose to add <clears throat> are completely unforced and and natural so that's what's also beautiful um you also have a very special little thing that you probably don't think about that you do but at the end of the note it kind of it it de decrescendos at the end of a phrase but it just does this little wobbling kind of thing I mean, if you hear him play, I'm not, well, I can ask you to do something. You know what I'm talking about? Um, is it really a long note, which the vibrato comes Yeah, in? it's just like, you know, just play Georgia again. Go ahead, just play it, and, and then and then we, we'll, we'll hear what, what it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you can't help but love Snake Davis. It's that simple. Beautiful. <laughs> okay, so now <clears throat> I want to also talk about um, your other horns, because the first time I heard you play, mm -hmm. you played alto, yeah. and everybody thought, this is the greatest alto player we've ever heard. We want him to marry us. And then <laughs> you picked up the tenor, and you sounded like Snake Davis still. Mm. And then you picked up the flute, and and we did sessions where you were playing flute, and you still sounded exactly like Snake Davis. Can you explain to people why that is? Uh, well, it's as far as I can tell, and as far as I know, it's to do with a lot of things which you've already mentioned. And I'm, you know, it's lovely to hear you pinpoint things like the dynamics. I mean, I don't, I, I never thought many people noticed the dynamics, uh, except possibly other saxophone players is that I could go and do a jazz gig, which I don't do that often, but when I do, the players who are in the audience, they come up to me and they, if it was Mornington Lockett, they'd be saying, what are you doing with that incredible harmonic lick thing? And they come up to me and they say, how do you play so quiet? How do you do that? 
And so I think it's that. And, and it's, I think also it's my nature, the way I am. And I think it's comes from being a soul boy and, you know, I absolutely love Parker and Coltrane and Michael Parker, but I love Smokey Robinson and Rita Franklin even more. Right. You know, they're who I grew up with. And so I think it's the vocal thing. And it's, I mean, I've played so many long notes, Richard, quiet ones, loud ones, ones that come from breath, start to become a note, go up to a lion's roar, come back down to a whisper and then goes to the breath again and right. all the time i'm playing those long notes i'm thinking about sound i'm thinking is this is this is it better than yesterday you know is it better than last week is it am i going the right way what can i do to make it even warmer or to make it more soulful or to make it right. speak more and, and so I, I said a lot of that i guess yeah well the interesting thing about that is also from the point of view of humanity now, what, what we human beings find interesting is a story. And, you know, a lot of people use this phrase because it's commercially, it sounds good. They say, oh, yeah, I'm a storyteller. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you something. Most of them aren't. They're not storytellers. The only story they're telling is they want to, you know, make a lot of money or have a lot of illicit rumpy pumpy. But... Yeah. <clears throat> But the, but the truth is, they're not actually telling the story. Now, what makes a story great is a, a sense of drama. And what gives you drama? A Drama isn't man woke up, put on his clothes, went to work, came back, had dinner, and went to sleep. That's not a story. So what, what you provide by doing these dynamics, there's, there's something happening. There's an event. Here's the first event. Uh, here's the next event. Uh, okay, that, that something's just happened there. You've gone from, and the same thing happens that you create drama by the, the melodic inflections that you, the melodic um, additions that you give to a melody. Because if you play, bada, that's one thing. But if you say, want to tell you, Georgia, it sets up the listener to say, oh, something's going to happen. When you play, <laughs> man, you know something's coming soon. It's psychological. It's not, you don't think that literally, but that's yeah, yeah. What's going yeah. on in the mind of the listener. And you know that. You know yeah. that in your heart, but you know it intellectually too. You know what? Another thing is, Snake, I mean, I'm doing a lot of the talking in this interview, and I shouldn't be, but, I, but it's because I adore you that I want to, just explain to people how great you really are mm -hmm. the the even though you may not think that you're thinking intellectually about this stuff you actually are so what do you think of that i th i think that that ties in with a lot of things that i think about and talk about and just going back to what i was saying previously richard 10 years ago i, I would have been going even 10 years ago, I was already old, I was already in my 50s, but I still hadn't really spent that time analysing and going over things. Uh, and I would have gone, oh, really? But now, I'm, yeah, what you're saying ties in with things that I think about. And the story, a lot of the time, the story I'm telling people is, listen, listen how beautiful music can be. Listen to how a melody can take you to somewhere sad, somewhere mysterious, somewhere interesting, and then it can change your mood and bring you back. And this is how great music can be. I don't mean this is how great I am. I mean, this is listen to what music can do, listen to where it can take us. And on a good day, I'm living <coughs> and that, and that's what's happening to me. I'm just thinking, man, I'm the luckiest guy in the world, and I pick the best instrument in the world, and I play with the most wonderful musicians. And on a not so good day, I'm playing the part of that guy who is feeling that way on when he's at his best and his happiest. So it is a lot of, it is storytelling and it's a journey. Every, every piece of music I play has a, a starting point and then it goes hopefully somewhere interesting. It might take a turn that none of us had expected, not even me. And then it comes back somewhere and the mood changes and then it eventually arrives home and everybody goes, 
oh, wow, what just happened, you know? Well, I certainly feel that all the time. When I, when, and I've heard it, you know, from the first time I ever heard you play, that's exactly what I thought, and that's what everybody thought. Nice. Um, nice and, uh, um, I, I just want my listeners to know that this is, um, this is such a great pleasure for me, and, and Snake is one of the, I mean, you know, a lot of musicians are not very nice people. Snake is the, one of the nicest people that ever lived. And so, and so as a result, everybody just feels better when he's in the room because it just relaxes everybody. I mean, that's really the truth of it. Um, and and I, I won't tell the story now, maybe, but when we, on, on our first kind of professional uh, thing with Banzilla, there was a, there was a sort of a tense moment, no, not more than a moment, hours of tension. And Snake managed to diffuse that with his amazing playing and his personality. And uh, no one else could do that. And uh, it's a wonderful thing. Um, before we go, I, I would love you, because I know you have to get somewhere. You've got a gig or something, right? Um, I've got a gig right here. I do a stream. Oh, yeah, right. OK, good. Well. Nice. Well, I'm gonna work for a few minutes. <clears throat> well, yeah, and the, okay, so you have to interview me on your stream someday. That would be great. Um, but anyway, uh, I just want to uh, ask you about that stream. Talk, talk, talk about that and other little things that people can, where people can see you and and mm -hmm. uh, get into you. So just give yourself a big, fat plug right now. Okay. Well, I mean, Google is a wonderful thing, but uh, my go-to place is the website which is snakedavis.rocks that's pretty easy to remember i guess nice. and there are details of everything there's even those strange things we remember called gigs coming back into the diary now let's hope they actually happen but um what <coughs> i've been doing during lockdown in order to stay connected with lovely audience people is is live streaming every friday night and every sunday at uh, 7 p.m gmt and uh, yeah, YouTube live donations completely optional, big long guest list, and the details are all there. And I love meeting new people all the time. It's fantastic. Well, that's that's great, Snake. And um, this has been a total, utter human pleasure for me. And and uh, I I I can't stand the fact that we haven't done anything together. So we're mm -hmm. going to and. Long time. and no choice. I'm going to throw music in front of you and torture you again. Yay! Yeah, soon. Um, and so um, with that, I'll just say good night, Snake. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to do this. And uh, I see that shakuhachi behind you. I, I'm, mm. I'm just tempted to ask you to pick it up and play a few notes just because it's so... I see it temptingly. Yes, there he is. Now you see this thing? <laughs> This looks like an old piece of bamboo, but no. In yeah, that John Thurkel calls it the chair leg. Look at that chair leg. Yeah, baby. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. can you just play, give us a few notes on that? That was really I, I'm sorry, but I just can't end this interview. I just can't. I want I want to hear just a few snaking sounds. Beautiful. That and you know it's amazing how well that instrument suits the snake concept. Now, it, <clears throat> can you do bending on that thing? Because you you know, I I didn't hear any bending just then. Yeah, there you go.
Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Well, I, you know, I just couldn't stand it without hearing it because it was like, oh, it the I saw it in the corner. And, <clears throat> and I also want to mention Snake is probably, I have to see, I, I can't end the interview. Snake is one of the best dressed musicians that you will ever see. And he has a special uh, selection of shirts, which are absolutely mind blowing. You want to just say a few words about those? Well, I'm incredibly lucky, Richard, as is any any man who has a good woman in his life. And I have a wonderful woman in my life, Sally. And she, amongst many, many other things, is a brilliant seamstress. So she must have made me 20 shirts by this stage, you know, and a special occasion comes along like the, tw the 100th stream, for example, a new shirt appears. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, <laughs> uh, I may have to... Uh find out what what i have to go through and what i have to do in order to get one of those but uh they are they are beautiful they really uh, i will tell her and, well, and she will do it it helps to show the style of this man who is all all style all content all heart snake davis thank you thank you richard real pleasure to see you and hear you are you still quarantined at home, doing your best not to fall asleep in the lonely, mind-numbing silence of it all? Fear not. Help is at hand from me, Richard Niles. Listen to my podcast, Radio Richard, and you'll hear intriguing interviews and heart-palpitating performances from master musicians like Maria Schneider, Trevor Horn, Hamish Stewart from the Average White Band, and the free play duo. <laughs> Believe me, you'll be glad you're alone with no one to distract you from all this amazing stuff. Don't miss a moment of the fun. Subscribe to Radio Richard. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs>